I'm Mark Stobie, this is XDA TV, and this is the Galaxy Z Flip 4. It's the most accessible foldable phone and one of the most fun phones I've personally ever used, admittedly as someone who's still pretty new to the world of foldables. The Flip 4 has been around for a couple of months already, so I've had time to form a few opinions on this form factor and what works and what doesn't. And given this kind of foldable wouldn't necessarily be my first choice of phone, there's a lot that surprised me about how I've used the Flip over the past few weeks. So here are my five main takeaways from two months with the Galaxy Z Flip 4. Take a sec to subscribe and we'll get started. So this is the first time I've used this kind of clamshell foldable for any real length of time. The type of foldables that normally appeal to me more are the larger ones that fold out into a tablet, so I'd kind of assumed that I'd just end up using it fully opened out without really taking advantage of the flex mode or the outer display. But as I've spent more time with it, I've appreciated a lot of the little things about this form factor. Firstly, opened out, this is a pretty tall phone, and the fact that it's taller means that multitasking feels a bit more natural, even more so than larger Android phones like the Pixel 7 Pro and Samsung's own S22 Ultra. There's enough vertical space here that two apps at once actually can fit quite comfortably on screen, even taking into account controls at the top and bottom in apps like Twitter. The whole UI is scaled in a way that definitely favors information density in apps and other parts of Android. And Samsung's multitasking is pretty much second to none on Android, with quick controls for swapping apps or replacing apps in the top and bottom window. Plus there's this handy three-finger swipe gesture to open multi-window. Meanwhile, Samsung's lab components lets you force stubborn apps, looking at you Instagram, to actually play nicely with multi-window in a way that's not possible on most other Android phones. A few apps like YouTube and the camera app have their own custom configuration for flex mode when the phone's half open like this, but for apps that don't, you have the option for this flex mode panel, kind of a folding phone utility belt. It has a few shortcut buttons, plus this little miniature trackpad, and using it sort of makes it look like a miniature version of the folding screen laptops we've seen recently. So yeah, considering the size of this thing, it's a way more capable multitasker than I'd expected, with some really thoughtful software additions that elevate it above what the basic Android OS can do. This form factor does carry some compromises though, both obvious and non-obvious. The nature of foldables means there needs to be more conspicuous bits of plastic around the screen border compared to a regular flagship. That's understandable, they need to be there to protect the display. There's also a visible and feelable crease in the middle where it folds, which is more noticeable than some rivals like Huawei's P50 Pocket, and unlike that phone, the Flip 4 doesn't fold completely flat. Of all these hardware imperfections, I think the one that bothers me the most is the crease. It's not horrible, but it is pretty visible in certain lighting conditions and if you're viewing it off angle. The gap, I mean it's not ideal and it's very easy to show on camera, but you don't really see it unless you go looking for it. The tiny extra bit of thickness it adds doesn't really make much difference to pocketability. And for what it's worth, if you're worried about dust accumulating on the display because of the screen gap, then that's a minor bugbear that affects all outward folding phones, even the ones that do appear to fully fold flat. Pocketability is worth talking about. For me personally, the fact this thing folds into a smaller footprint isn't a huge deal. My pockets can easily hold this thing whether it's opened out or closed, but I don't doubt that this is a huge deal if you're gonna be carrying your phone in a smaller handbag or clothed with smaller pockets. It's a game changer in the same way that other foldables are able to fit a tablet sized screen into regular big phone sized pockets. The build quality is as excellent as you'd expect from a Samsung foldable. I enjoy the contrast between the glossy area up top housing the secondary display and the matte glass of the rest of the back, especially in this Bora purple color. Kind of reminds me of one of my favorite phone designs, the Panda paint job on the white Pixel 2 XL. And the hinge, although unchanged from last year, is still pretty excellent, pretty firm even after a few months, and usable at just about any angle. When it's closed, the Flip 4 gives you access to this 1.9 inch outer display, which is unchanged from the Flip 3. I haven't used it every day, but when I have, I've enjoyed it. However, at the same time, it's pretty obvious to me that this just needs to be bigger. Right now, it alternates between running a handful of app widgets for the core Samsung apps and giving you a window into your notifications, which would be nice if you want to check a message without fully opening up the phone. But yeah, the natural direction for this feature is pretty clearly going to be the entire footprint of the phone when it's closed being taken up by a display. Whether it takes a year or a decade, eventually screen creep is rightly going to gobble up this entire surface here, letting you do almost as much on a closed Z Flip as you can on a Z Fold with its large outer screen. The challenge for those coming generations of flip phones is going to be balancing this limited space between ballooning screen sizes and multiplying camera counts. Which takes us neatly to the double-edged sword, which is the Flip 4's cameras.
and I've enjoyed these cameras quite a bit more than I'd expected. Having used the S22 Ultra a bunch before this, I expected it to feel like a big photographic downgrade. The major thing you're losing versus a flat phone at this price point is of course a telephoto camera. For £150 less than this, for instance, Google will sell you a fantastic trio of ultra-wide, 50 megapixel main and 5x telephoto in the Pixel 7 Pro. But in day-to-day -day shooting, I was pretty impressed with shots from both cameras. Maybe not too surprising there, since this is literally just two out of the three regular Galaxy S22 cameras. But anyway, these are as versatile as anything in a Samsung flagship, with the pleasing, punchy colors that Samsung fans have come to expect, and extremely capable portrait and night modes. I've noticed a little more grain in lower light shots from the ultra-wide versus the equivalent cameras in the Pixel 7 Pro and iPhone 14 Pro, but you really need to go pixel peeping to spot these tiny flaws. This proven S22 level camera setup is augmented by the fact this phone is basically its own tripod. Whether you're taking a video call on the surprisingly decent front-facing camera, or shooting a long exposure or time-lapse over a few hours. The granular control that this hinge gives and the stability when it's propped up really makes you rethink the way you use a phone for photos and video. That's counterbalanced by the slightly baffling camcorder mode when the phone is folded at a 90 degree angle. Aside from some late 90s nostalgia, I found this feature to be mostly just a gimmick. And the auto framing feature for video is technically impressive, and if you're shooting a lot of content for TikTok then it could be useful, but for me it's been mostly forgettable. There are a couple of genuinely neat camera software tricks as well though. When it's folded half open, Flexbone lets you relocate the viewfinder to either portion of the display, useful if you're shooting from an unusual perspective, and of course Cover Display Preview lets your subjects see how they'll look in the miniature outer screen, though good luck seeing anything much if they're more than a few feet away. That brings us to the greatest unique strength of this and most other foldables, unparalleled selfie quality thanks to the option to use those primary cameras for front-facing photography. As good as front-facing cameras in flat phones have become, you can't beat a selfie taken with a primary camera with extra goodies like OIS, autofocus, and a larger sensor size. The size of the outer screen is big enough to avoid too much squinting, you can just about make out the image and frame things up correctly, but once again I think it's inevitable that future flips will have to go with way larger outer displays for this and many other reasons. So what you lose in telephoto performance you gain in selfie prowess. For a lot of people I think that's going to be a fair trade. For me, though I do appreciate everything the Flip's unique form factor can do for photography, I think the next gen of clamshell phones will need some sort of telephoto to continue justifying that thousand dollar price. The Flip 4 is one of a handful of Android phones using Qualcomm's much heralded mid-cycle refresh of its Snapdragon 8 series, the 8 Plus Gen 1. It's faster, sure, than the earlier 8 Gen 1, but the major difference you'll actually notice is in efficiency, which is why even though the battery capacity remains relatively small at 3700 mAh, I always manage to get a full day out of the Flip 4 with around 4-4.5 four four hours of screen on time. Battery anxiety hasn't been totally banished though, and this phone definitely doesn't offer the next level efficiency that we see from some other phones like the Zenfone 9 with a smaller screen and a bigger battery. But it is adequate in a way that the Flip 3 definitely wasn't according to my XDA colleagues who used it last year. Charging speeds aren't all that exciting either, clocking in at 25 watts over a wire or 10 watts wirelessly, an upgrade over the Flip 3 but still nothing to write home about. There's always a balance between battery capacity and charging speeds though, so I think Samsung struck a pretty decent balance here. When it comes to performance overall, we already knew that the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 was a fast chip, and that's reflected in everything this phone does. Even with a slightly less than top tier 8GB of RAM, I never felt like this phone had any trouble keeping up with heavy multitasking. The bigger difference I've noticed in this device compared to the Galaxy S22 Ultra is in animation speed and just day-to-day -day smoothness. Granted, I'm coming from the Exynos Galaxy S22 Ultra, which is considered to be a slower and hotter running chip. So that's definitely an element of performance improvement that you can see here, possibly combined with some software tweaks in One UI 4.1.1. Overall then, after a couple of months with the Galaxy Z Flip 4, this is definitely one of the most fun phones I've used in a long time, and a really accessible entry point into the world of foldables. I've been surprised how much I've been able to make use of its fairly unique form factor, either as a tiny mouse-sized laptop or an integrated camera stand. The more efficient chip and a bigger battery mostly put an end to battery anxiety, and you're basically seeing the entire Galaxy S22 experience in this phone, only with one less camera and slightly better performance. But I also feel like with rivals like Motorola and Huawei already pushing the bar higher in terms of the basics of what makes this kind of foldable special, we need a more comprehensive upgrade for the Flip in 2023. Features like an undisplayed camera, a less noticeable crease, and a truly flat folding design should all be in contention, along with an extra rear camera and potentially an expanded outer display. 
Will we get all of this stuff next time around at the same $9.99 price point? I doubt it, but even half of that stuff would make for a serious upgrade of the kind this line really needs in 2023. Let me know what you think of the Galaxy Z Flip 4 down in the comments if you've used one or you're thinking of picking one up, and in what direction should the Flip line go in 2023? Should it go all in with premium features or cherry pick the ones that really matter to hit that lower price? Subscribe to XDA TV here on YouTube so you don't miss our future foldable coverage. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.